Hello everyone, this is local Tico Brohe. Back again, this time with a fighter solo run. Going over our gear, we have a couple different elemental weapons as well as obviously the physical ones and then silence and torpor. Our helmets providing additional strength when targeted by a large number of enemies. Our belt, more importantly, is providing us additional stagger. Very important and valuable for a fighter to be able to stagger things. Our gloves have the increased damage with uh, shield abilities. And our legs are providing the stability augment for us so we do not have to slot it in our actual abilities. For rings, we have the barbed nails, increased stagger and knockdown. We have a ring of desiccation, of course. We have a soul skewer and sheltered assault ring, as well as two pairs of bloody knuckles that we will use to increase our shield damage on specific fights. Looking at our abilities, we have Antler Toss, Soul Skewer, Hindsight Sweep as our sword abilities, Symbol Onslaught, Shield Sword, and Sheltered Assault for the shield abilities. Shield we're not going to use except for very specifically. Augments, kind of standard. Uh, we do have Acuity, however, for the magic damage and Predation for 100 health when we kill things. That will be our healing for this run. Starting the runoff. Garden of Ignominy. I don't hear Greater Goblins, so I'm going to assume we have the Saurian configuration, which we can see now. The Saurian configuration brings us death as the Carrion Beast possible. So, that's uh, much kinder than Garm uh, as a fighter. Fighting three Garm is not the worst thing, but it's not fun either. <laughs> well, Perhaps it's fun, but it's it's a painful kind of fun, that's for sure. Um, there's that hindsight sweep. When you get that sound effect, that means that you were going to deal extra damage. Unfortunately, we did not actually hit anybody, so we didn't deal any extra damage. Um, as already evidenced by the damage we've taken, this is not going to be a no-hit run. Uh, that's also why we have the predation augment. Those of you who do not know how the Predation Augment works, uh, basically whenever you kill something, you gain 100 health. It's as simple as that. 100 health per kill. Um, it doesn't matter what you kill, whether it be this Siren, a Leapworm, a Spider, a Garm, all of them are 100 health. There are a couple exceptions, however. Killing a Golem does not net you 100 health, because we don't really kill Golems, we, like, break their medallions, and... Their medallions don't give us health, and the golem dying itself doesn't give us any health. However, metal golems, when we break their medallions, it does give us health. I don't know. I think it's because it's a separate entity as far as the game's concerned, and that entity dies. We don't get an extra 100 health, though, when the entire thing dies, though, so... A mystery. Uh, another exception is going to be on Corrupted Pawns. Corrupted Pawns do not yield us 100 health per kill either. Um, that might be actually lore reasons because kind of beyond the normal scope of life. So it's possible the Arisen cannot absorb whatever life essence a pawn has or something. This is pure speculation on my part. <laughs> I am not a lore expert for this game. Uh, but, if any of you listening are a lore expert, please, let me know in the comments the reason why we don't get health back from the game by killing Corrupt Fonts. I'd love to know. Corrupt Fonts have a couple of weird interactions with the Risen, so I'd be very interested to see how that works. Um, another exception might be death. I don't remember. For whatever reason, my mind is telling me that we don't get extra health for death, but... Uh, that would be so few and far between getting a kill on death as a fighter that I don't genuinely remember. Although, we might get a kill this run. We'll have to see how much health death has when we fight him in a few. Uh, I genuinely do not recall. Um, fighting that... 
Ooh, we actually could get a kill on death. He only has two health bars. Um, we won't get it here, but we might get it later in the run. We'll have to see whether we get health back. Unfortunately, if we're full health when we kill death, we won't know one way or the other. But we'll have to make a note of it when that happens. Assuming we get him to spawn a second time. Which is pretty consistent. But um, our fight that we had with the Gore Chimera is a pretty good example of how the fighter uh, playstyle operates. Our goal is generally to block attacks to get stagger and knock them down with things like antler toss. And then uh, once enemies are staggered and knocked down, we can kind of deal some damage to them while they are laying on the ground, whether that be with antler toss or just our regular attacks. Um, surprisingly sheltered Assault or Fusilade, as we have the ring for it, does actually very good damage. Um, very high damage per second on that move. If you're able to hit a like critical point, like uh, the head of the goat or a lion with the appropriate damage, obviously. Physical for the goat, magic for the lion. Um, you'll note we did not use ice damage on the Gore Chimera either. Frankly, it's just not that valuable to us. Um, the Almace doesn't have as high of a magic stat, I guess. It doesn't have as high as a strength stat either as our Cursed Light. So most of our damage is going to be physical. There's just not a whole lot of reason and utility in bringing the Almace because it, it doesn't change the fight versus using Cursed Light on, the, on any enemy that we would want ice damage on, frankly. Not, not enough. So, we just don't. It doesn't matter. Like, yes, it's better, but it's not exponentially better or enough to change the fight in a meaningful way. So, I would rather not have it just for weight constraints reasons. We do, however, uh, make use of Kalid Bolg a few times, but the reason we're using Kalid Bolg is to chain lightning damage to multiple enemies when that's relevant. Um, mostly, that's going to be when we're killing critters. Spiders, specifically, are really easy to kill with lightning damage because it'll guarantee proc on the first swing when you swing at the first spider, and it will chain to all of the nearby spiders, so you can generally clear a room of spiders with one sword swing. Pretty valuable. Um, especially when critters become pretty valuable for us with a predation augment equipped. Full circle. But with that, the Garden of Ignominy is complete. A very smooth run so far. We've got full health leaving the first room. So, the solo fighter run is... All of the solo melee runs are pretty fun. They are very slow, though, because you have to wait for enemies to give you the right opportunities. Um, fortunately, on this run, we have enough of the right opportunities to make things work well for ourselves, but... That doesn't necessarily mean it becomes less frustrating when we fight things like whites or liches or, you know, for example, this dragon, who is a huge pain because he always wants to fly into the air. And as a melee vocation, we can't knock him down until we kind of get lucky. There you see me using the uh, shield attack. I don't remember what it's called, like a uh, symbol or something like that. I don't remember. I would have to look it up. I don't know the name of the shield abilities particularly well, if I'm being honest. Um, but they were using that because the shield deals bludgeoning damage, and gargoyles are weak at bludgeoning. So the shield just does considerably more damage than our sword does. The limitation is that we have considerably less range with the shield than we do with the sword, so it doesn't maintain its usefulness perpetually. There you saw us switch to the double barbed nails, that's so that we can get a knockdown on the wyvern. I had to remember the correct term for this one.
So the shield actually has a pretty good stagger on it. It'll knock that thing down pretty nicely. The problem is it's difficult to hit the uh, tail. Part of the reason why it does it so well, though, is because you can use the shield assault move, whatever it's called. Symbol Onslaught. <laughs> you can use Symbol Onslaught uh, rapidly. It hits fast. It hits fast and it only uses stamina very little. Like on the first swing and then like you can do a three follow-ups or something like that before it consumes really any meaningful amount of stamina after it. So, it's a great move. Um, unfortunately, like I said, it's kind of tricky to land. Unfortunately, as a fighter, we don't have really that good of a option anyway. Here, you'll see, we'll switch rings to the sheltered assault ring so that we can make use of sheltered fuselage. Because, as I said before, if you get to hit a weak point, it is really good damage. <laughs> like there, we were hitting only some of them because we were kind of going in between... Uh, we were going through the body to hit the heart, which you can do if you have enough, you know, thrust. But, uh, in this case, we do. Um, but not every hit. But even still, we did quite good damage. This pauses because I'm likely responding to something in chat. Uh, we do stream these runs live over at twitch.tv slash local brohe. You guys should pop in. I stream Monday through Friday. It's nice. I was about to also say that it looks like we forgot to switch our ring back, but then I remember. <laughs> if you stand in the right position when they fly up and you get a perfect block off, however, when you do a perfect block, it does like a little area of effect damage, shockwave type deal. And if you're in the right spot, you can carry the wings, the wing flap, and you can actually hit the dragon's wings with it. Um, it's a very useful thing. It doesn't generally do enough to knock it down immediately, so it's not like critical that we did not do that. But it does speed the process up a touch. So if you can, I'd recommend it. Um, it's obviously much easier if you're playing as a Mystic Knight, because you can then have say, the flame repost on, and it'll actively shoot fireballs at the uh, dragon instead of, you know, a passive shockwave around it. But it is still valuable to get that little stagger buildup. Say so here we should switch rings again. That rock kind of messed us up there a little bit. Even with that, we still got two health bars down without really having that much uptime on hitting the heart. So, as I was saying, sheltered assault, sheltered fuselage, very effective moves. Um, I kind of slept on sheltered assault is sheltered fuse a lot for a really long time um, but I'm definitely a definitely a believer um, I really only started using it a couple solo fighter runs ago uh, I don't mean like on this batch of runs though I mean like a year or two back when I did a different solo fighter playthrough um, and I kind of really use it for the first time. And, uh, because I always kind of slept on the shield abilities. But it's, it is quite effective. The thing that makes it as valuable to me is that it's one, good damage, but two, it's very precise. I don't have to worry about missing the spot I'm trying to hit so long as I landed the first shot, I can follow up cleanly. Um, but it's also not very expensive, it's a very efficient amount of damage for stamina, which is valuable when you play on hard mode, which is what we're playing on, because hard mode you consume more stamina when you use attacks. 
That was me trying to get to the right spot so that when we do the perfect block on the wing, we actually hit the wing. We might have hit it. It was kind of an awkward angle. Um, I need to be a little bit closer f towards its face. But I think we still got it. I would have to slow it down to pay attention. And it, ultimately, it doesn't matter. We don't have enough stagger buildup that it would have knocked it down anyway. Because we did knock it down just then when we did hit it. So... Somewhat irrelevant. Do you see how difficult it is to hit the tail with the shield? Um, obviously, we are quite quick, so we get many attempts, but they are somewhat painful attempts. Interesting tidbit about using the shield, which we will make use of later in the run, is that if you have the barbed nails, sorry, not barbed nails, bloody knuckles equipped, and you remove your sword but maintain your shield, when you use the shield attacks, the shield bashes themselves. Um, not sheltered assault, although also sheltered assault is just you're punching, so it's not that great anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's not as good as just having a sword, but uh, if you're using Symbol Onslaught or Shield Storm, you will deal additional damage, and they stack multiplicatively, so the Glove Augment gives us double damage with our shield. The Each Barb Nail will also give us double damage, but again, they stack multiplicatively, so with two of them stacking, we have four times the damage on our shield with all three we have eight eight times so it becomes very powerful i don't know why i keep running to this side and i could have easily ran to the other but that's okay again an excellent demonstration of both predation because we got 100 health for killing that dragon even though it took us a million years um, but of both predation augment working for us as well as the sheltered assault or fusillade move very powerful the word of regret word of regret can have two different configurations one has giant skeletons in the first area the other has ghosts we'd prefer the giant skeletons um neither configuration is particularly fast but this configuration because we got ghosts uh we wanted to avoid because it has a living armor later and while living armor isn't the worst thing for us to fight uh, and in fact it's kind of fun as a fighter because the way we're going to deal with it is uh, uh, almost cheesy feeling um, we just we, we'll just have a lot more damage than you'd expect is all I'll say but uh, fighting ghosts in living armor is not fun really so, we struggle a little bit on dealing with them. At the very least, we struggle with the motivation aspect of it. As we frantically hop down this, uh, <laughs> ray. And, for those of you paying attention, you'll see 100 health each time, each kill. We're about to kill a handful of... Spiders, so we switch to Khaled Bolg for the lightning damage. Here you'll see the chain. I'll swing at one. And they all die. Very, very easy. Now here is where our training <laughs> and our knowledge of the way barbed or bloody knuckles stacks with our glove augment works when we don't have a weapon equipped. Uh, we're going to do some pretty good damage to this, uh, this guy with just our shield. That was one perfect block. A health bar and a half. I don't want to get hit by that. If you can perfect block that move, it's not that bad, but it is very awkward, the timing on it, so I generally just try to sidestep it. I can always follow up. That move you can perfect block, but it always staggers you like that. You see how much damage you did with one shield bash? 
not every hit will proc the damage when you're doing it from the front. But if you did get a perfect block off, you can hit them from the front. Yeah, see, that one just did. This is why we have the Dragon's Roost in our inventory at all. It's exclusively to deal with living armor. Um, and as you can see, it's very effective. That is one of the fastest solo run kills on living armor that we've done. If you've watched my... This is Soul Skewer. I love Soul Skewer as an ability. Um, it's not really the best move or anything, but it CCs what you're trying to hit. So they won't do anything. So this guy isn't going to spew poison and cover the floor. I get to do damage for free. He can't do anything about it. Beautiful move. It's only downside is that you are vulnerable during it. So if you're fighting multiple enemies, you'll probably just get hit. If I was low health there, you see I would have gotten back a bunch of health. I say a bunch. We don't have that great of magic defense, I'm sure. But we would have gotten back a pretty decent amount of health because we would proc it probably eight times during that soul skewer. Midnight Helix, we just heard a roar, so we know we have the Frostworm. I would prefer this configuration, um, if only because it's faster. Uh, the other one has a Prisoner Gore Cyclops, which is not a very quick kill. Not what I'm eager to do. Um, this is another example of Fighter playing to its uh, idea as far as how gameplay should operate, and that is we want to stagger and knock down our enemies so that we can hit them with the uh, damage while they're down. The reason knocking them down is important is fighter's damage is okay. It's not terrible by any means, but it isn't like the most impressive. I don't want to get too close to that move because it can... The circle is pretty precise, but it does have some range beyond the hard edges of the circle. And I don't want to get caught just because I'm being goofy. So that was unfortunate that he cast a two X keys there, but that's okay. We'll get another opportunity. Anyway, um, we want to knock the dragon down for two reasons. One, fighter by itself is still somewhat vulnerable. I mean, you have the shield, yes, but you're still somewhat vulnerable. And two, while we do pretty good physical damage there are things that you know there are limitations to how we can do it knocking things down unlocks our ability to do damage and because things are no longer in combat or in you know fighting stances we'll just do additional damage to them so it's kind of extremely valuable in that regard now here is awkward because we didn't get the kill there because the bolide prevented us once again we have the stability augment, so here we're not really bothered by the wing collapse. But I would like to knock him down one more time, which we've managed to do, because this should give us the kill. We're no longer, the first two we were blocked because we had spells uh, preventing us from hitting the heart. This time he's just vulnerable. Um, if we hadn't had an opportunity to knock it down there, what I probably would have liked to have done is switch to the... Uh, our golden sword, I don't remember what it is. It's the golden rapier, I think we have. The golden rapier. And silenced it using sheltered fuselage. Because uh, it just hits the fastest. And uh, in doing that, what we would choose to do is just silence it so that it can't heal. Because the dragon's not overly concerning with its spells, but if it heals, we are in trouble. There I ran out of stamina. It's kind of unfortunate. Fortunately, this is not a no-hit run, so it is A-OK. -okay. I guess now we just have a chance to get a Blood Red Crystal, which I don't have a use for on this run because we've already gold forged all the equipment we're going to use, but they are always exciting to get. Good example of how perfect block can uh, impact your opponent very nicely. Um, 
but also how imperfect block sets us up very nicely as well. Even if we don't get a perfect block off, getting an imperfect block off often puts an opponent in a very good spot for us to just swing our sword at them. But if we get to just swing our sword at them like that, you know, we're happy because we, we get to deal some, some damage. We get to ostensibly build up some stagger and knockdown, hopefully, that's going to then enable us to do the rest of what we want, which is, you know, knock them down and then deal damage. In this case, we never knocked him down, but it still put him at a the right arm's distance for us to, you know, deliver the hurt. <laughs> Continuing up, we're going to have two more uh, Strigoi. I tend to go to this cage right in front of us because uh, I don't want them to be coming at me from multiple angles. Ideally, one of them flies in the cage with me and I get to kind of wail on him. As you can see, it's a little bit awkward trying to wail on him. The other one was courteous enough to let us beat up his friend first, so we have pretty smooth sailing from here out. Finish with the shield slap. Now, I struggle to remember which configuration has what. I do believe that this is the room that can have a cursed dragon as its carrion beast, though. And the prisoner gore cyclops has death. But I might have that backwards. In any case, we didn't get it. A lot of times after I kill the things up top and I start walking back down is when that carrion beast spawns. But not this time. Now backtracking through the Ward of Regret, we don't hear the music for death. Death can spawn in this room. Um, it's not very common. Death spawns where the living armor would have been. Um, obviously we've already killed the living armor, but that's where he spawns. Sometimes you'll get the Elder Ogre or Death to spawn after you've been to the Midnight Helix and are backtracking. It doesn't really make a huge difference. Um, we are full health once again, by the way. That predation augment is putting in work for us. Again, I cannot recommend enough. You are even approaching competent with uh, playing this game solo. And you're looking to have fun with a run. I would highly recommend using predation as your healing. Um, it's very satisfying to know that, okay, I just got hit by something. Let me heal by being successful. It's a very satisfying feeling to know that you got your health back after getting it low because you were successful. <laughs> Vault of Defiled Truth. Um, we're going to kill these goblins first. Generally, I run here and do a full moon slash. We don't have that option. We don't have it. But they are weak, so we just swing at them. There are two configurations we can have. One is... Gore Cyclops, the other is a Cockatrice. Since I do not hear wing flaps of a Cockatrice, I'm going to assume it's Cyclops, which we can see. This configuration has Garm as the potential carrying beast. It also has three Sirens. I want to kill the Sirens first and foremost. Because the Sirens can and will heal the other creatures. And the heal is actually quite quick. Um, in a matter of seconds, they can heal something from like you know, close to dead, to full health. And uh, that's not what we want. Here you see our first use of Corpor. We're gonna slow these guys down. Um, uh, here I'm throwing the rocks so that he doesn't try and pick it up and throw it at me. I don't want him to do that. Um, here I'm Corporing him so that I'm given more time to hit the base and things like that. These guys are kind of just a bit of a pain. This is another part where we could have used ice damage and it would not have been bad but it just kind of isn't that much better than just our regular damage there we got hit pretty effectively i'm trying to like move on to his face but the game's just not letting me move that way but yeah here we get the torpor off we swing on this guy's face as you see we do quite good damage we do have a lot of strength but the torpor is there so that i don't get grabbed 
Now that we've succeeded, I should move out of the way, and then I'll switch to the rested sword again. And we shall reapply it. Well, not reapply it, we'll apply it to the second one. And then we'll hopefully go for the same thing. We were very fortunate on the first uh, Gore Cyclops, and he did a combination that will not... Or it's, it's a long enough combination that he won't grab us, or make an attempt to, at the very least, for a good amount of time. Um, but there are other combos that are not as slow. And he's actually... No, never mind. I was gonna say, he's actually giving us a good pattern here. Oh no, he is, he is. Um, but yeah, not every combination is as slow as the others, so... That was a goofy interaction with us being on his face and then him covering his eye. Torport again. I hope that if they bring Poison back in Dragon's Dogma 2, they make it relevant. Uh, I find the Poison debilitation to be more frustrating than not, because it often... If you look at the debilitation that's on the bar for our enemy here, uh, you see that it cycles between Poison and Torpor. Um, the problem I have with it is now Torpor's falling off, and I can tell because his move speed increased, but sometimes you don't notice because it just switches to poison and torpor frequently, and you're just like, oh, it just switch to poison, but it'll switch to poison and turn off the torpor, and it catches you off guard. Um, so torpor kind of baits you a little bit. Not, not enough to really be a problem, but it does bait you a little bit. The problem I have with poison is that it doesn't really have any value with it though like i it, it just doesn't deal enough damage to anything to be more than <laughs> a nuisance to uh i love when that happens to be more than a nuisance than the uh to us about the debilitation than it does damage to the enemy so it's just a minor annoyance point. If they don't change it at all, I won't really be upset in Dragon's Dogma, but it is something that I hope that they address, because poison just seems very useless, even if you have the augment from Assassin. I can't remember what it's called at the moment. Here, we're going to hit most of these. One of them should drop down. So there's two more up there. That one that just casted that spell screen should fall. There he is. Now, once this one's dead, we're just going to wait until the other caster uses Ingle. When it casts Ingle, it can't hit us when we're down here because the the way Ingle is cast, it, uh, it is a targeted... Or, sorry, it, it, it will only go, like, laterally. He can't aim down. He can't really aim up with it very well. Um, they can kind of aim up, actually, but he can't aim down very well. What's more is there's just things in the way. So even if he did aim down at this very well, he can't hit us. So Ingle is our perfect opportunity to just slip on by. And we take it. Here we can have the Garm spawn, which, there they are. Um, Garm, we actually do pretty okay damage. The problem is it's not safe. Uh, we're going to use Sheltered Fuselade usually to kind of... One apply Torpor for any who's rusted, but we'll use Sheltered Fuselot a lot to do damage, because if we get to hit the face, it does honestly incredible damage. And uh, we like that. <laughs> the problem is there are three, and it, they are very dangerous, so I don't want to get hit by them. But here you see me just holding my shield up. We only have Shelter to Sold. I'm not sure if I just didn't notice yet that I don't have the ring equipped or if that's intentional. I would expect I just don't know. But at any rate, it is a decent strategy. It's not fast by any means, but it is decent. 
Handler toss is another good one if you just want to get a quick hit in and you know that you're going to land it. Because it does hit, I don't know, like six times. So. Perfect block. As always, is very effective. Here we could honestly switch to the Dragon's Roost. It probably has enough stability to block that move without staggering us. I'm not 100% confident that that's true. But I expect it to be close to true. But the lightning damage would be kind of nice. Especially since we have the, uh, the gloves that boost our shield abilities. Those gloves impact the stagger and the repost damage. Or not the repost damage, but the, uh, the damage from getting a perfect block off. Deflect. Deflect is what it's called. There we go. I've noticed. But yeah, see? We're kind of hitting the shoulder. We're absolutely churning through this guy's health bar. So it's... Sheltered Fusilot's quite an effective move. The only ring I would have preferred over this would have maybe been Sheltered Fusilod plus um, Hindsight Sweep. But realistically, this is probably the better one. I just like Hindsight Sweep a lot, so I'm going to go it. Uh, I don't like this position, but I will take advantage of it if I can. Even though I've lost some health. Again, this is one of the cool things about a predation run. I'm okay with sacrificing some of my resources here, which in this case my resources include my health. But I'm okay with sacrificing some of my health here to get the kills, because I know that in the next room I'll be able to get some back. Hell, I have 300 health in this room alone, because I've got these two guys to kill, and then I have a goblin, a hobgoblin left. But even in the next room... Oh, there's like seven Saurian we could have, maybe the same number of poison and giant undead that we'll have to kill. That's a good amount of health back. Plus, we'll be able to use Holy if we get the undead configuration. So that's even more health back. So, you know, 700 health from where we're at right now is pretty comfortable. I mean, that's, you know, almost 4,700 health. I don't think anybody's concerned about having too little health when they have close to 5k. So, you know, we're pretty happy with that. Unfortunately, if we get uh, the living, or sorry, the undead configuration in the next room, where it's only going to have corrupted pawns in the gutter portion, which is something we do not get health back off of. But if we get sorry, and we're going to have great goblins, we'll have an Elder Ogre spawn most likely, we'll have two Eliminators, so we can actually effectively get full health before we fight Gazer. Um, but even if we don't, so long as I survive the next room, when we do fight Gazer, every tentacle gives us 100 health, because every tentacle is its own, ident er, its own entity. So when we go and fight Gazer, we're going to get back like something like 1400 health fighting Gazer. So, again, we're, we're very, very happy to trade health here for success. We don't want to trade as much, you know, we don't want to trade really much more than we have. But, I don't know, it's a very dynamic run to me, seeing our health go down and then come back up all through just killing enemies. It's very satisfying. Not sure where our hit went, but we used hindsight sweep and we got the dodge off. But for whatever reason, it just didn't. We missed the follow-up swing, and there we're at 4k health. Now here, we don't do uh, we don't get health back from the predation augment fighting this guy at all. Um, furthermore, he's weak to bludgeoning, not slash, so our sword isn't the best tool. But it's kind of irrelevant because we just deal incredible damage here, as you see. I don't even know why I'm trying for that hand. I know we never hit that. We have to stagger him. And he's frozen. 
Which is okay. You see how when we use the shield, we just one-shot it, right? The shield's very effective here. Bludgeoning damage prevails against the uh, golems and their medallions. So the, the difference between bludgeoning is very nice. If we were playing a Mystic Knight and we had a mace and we had a sword that were of equal damage, the mace would just do considerably more than the sword does. That's a little bit unfortunate that we did get hit there um, before before he uh, allowed us to hit the hand, he did explode. I think it was like an angle problem. If I had moved beforehand, I think we would have been okay. But we kind of end this room with less health than I would have liked. I would have liked to have been in the 4K range. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not very worried. There's not many things that really concern me moving forward until the end of Gazer, which Gazer's going to give us a lot of health back. We do not have an undead up top with us, so I know this is the Saurian. Obviously, we've just seen it. Uh, this makes me a little bit happy as well, because we have a lot of opportunities to get health back. Uh, however, this also gives us the uh, Eliminator configuration, which, while not the worst enemy, they are a little bit scary in terms of... Uh, if we get stomped, if we get knocked down by one of the jumping goblins, you know, it's not not ideal. There's another soul skewer. Um, you can grab these giant sorry, and it's very, very quick, very effective, almost dirty. How good it is? Because they can't really do anything about it. They can block you if they're already blocking when you use the move. They can block you, but for the most part, you're going to land that attack, and it's it's very easy as I said before we're going to have a few greater goblins and then two eliminators one on either side um, we want to deal with the goblins first because the goblins while not scary in terms of damage they're scary because they can set up the eliminators very effectively by just doing their jump attack and knocking this over there are actually a few other attacks that can also knock us over if we get hit by them. Fortunately, we also do great damage. And they give us a great opportunity to get health back. As you can see, we're already back up to almost 5k. We haven't really done a whole lot. Now here's the secret eliminator tech of shield bash him, get perfect blocks off. Once again, we removed our weapon and put on the bloody knuckles. This is, again, because it boosts the damage of our shield attacks uh, multiplicatively, which because we have three things multi multiplying it by two, becomes exponential damage growth. One deflection was... I don't know, somewhere around 80% of a health bar, 75% of a health bar. It's hard to argue. That is not <laughs> the best way to deal with them on this run. Very enjoyable, very entertaining. One thing that's very fun about Mystic Knight and Fighter is getting those perfect blocks off. If you get perfect blocks off consistently, it is a very, very satisfying thing. I think it's more satisfying for Mystic Knight because they feel a lot more meaty because they have the repost spells attached to them. But it is very fun. Gazer, going into this fight, we already have 5100 health. But as I said before, each tentacle is going to give us health back as well. So we're actually pretty happy with our fight. I'm starting to run down here. 
There we go. See? 100 health right there. I'm starting to run down here a little bit because I do want to... If we are quick and capable, we can deal damage to... Uh, we can do enough damage to the eye if we get to poke it in the eye with this big tentacle attack to uh, basically stun it into giving us the kill. But I have to run the big tentacle over to him and I want to have as much of a head start basically of pathing as I can. Because he can do anywhere between like two and five of these big tentacle attacks. Um, there he only did two. You see what I mean? So we even cheated it there and we still were screwed. Um, that's okay. What we do instead is we bait that attack out, we climb up here, and we decide to shear the tentacles off directly. Shearing the tentacles off this way is a little bit annoying because actually hitting them is kind of goofy. So the hitboxes are kind of odd. But basically, if we shear all the tentacles off, he will start preparing a uh, cannon. Which is what we want, because that'll give us the opportunity again to just deal damage. Alternatively, what we could have done was jump onto his face and attack his eye directly until he makes the cannon. There we took damage from the Ingle. That's okay, it was only a little bit of damage. Why it was only a little bit of damage, I don't know. Usually that thing shreds. Um, but anyway, uh, once we kill this tentacle, we should be good. Killing the tentacle is going to net us some health. Alright, he's already summoning the can. We probably splat here. Oh no, we caught. Nice. Oh, we still splat. That's okay, we're about to get 400 health back for killing these tentacles total. And then we'll get 100 health for killing Gazer itself. You saw there I had a macabre sculpture on the ground. We have collected all 30 macabre sculptures. The reason that one's there is because it's New Games Plus. Because I wanted to get two barbed nails. And the easiest way to do that is just... Or not barbed nails, two bloody knuckles. And the easiest way to do that is to just switch to uh, New Game Plus and do the quest to... I think, I think all we have to do is rarify something that's been Dragonforged. And it gives you a... Uh, Barrack gives you a... Bloody Knuckle in return. So we that's why we have two. As I said, pretty easy fight. We're finishing with only... I think we... Are only missing like 20 health, something like that. It's really, really close. So, all told, a very good first third. And killing this rat will give us full health. As I said at the beginning, killing critters, very valuable suddenly because predation augment. Continuing with the Fortress of Remembrance. Uh, I don't see the Strigoi over there, which tells me we probably do not have the ghost configuration. Instead, we're going to have Undead. Confirmed now. Uh, Undead actually begins with six wards. So what you'll see is I'll move forward to try and get their attention first uh, before dealing with the poisoned Undead. This configuration can also have a uh, Elder Ogre. Is the way that I'm for. What's nice about the wards is they don't deal that much damage to me, so pretty much even if they all hit me, I still have enough opportunities to heal off of them. So there's kind of two ways I like to deal with these guys. I like to launch them off the cliff because it's not that difficult. Um, unfortunately, there are three of them, so what ended up happening there is I did walk into the poison because all, all three of them were able to spew poison before I was able to really engage them because the wards were distracting enough. 
Um, but what's nice is, as before, we can get some health back off of our soul skewer. Although that was just a bait skewer. Or no, sorry, that was a regular soul skewer. The upgrade is called bait skewer. I had that happen. But yeah, we're allowed to get some health back, which is very good for us. Um, what's nice about bait skewer is it also does really good damage. It is not as stamina efficient as I prefer, though. But on top of dealing good damage, it also staggers and, you know, it prevents them from dealing any damage to me whatsoever. So I'm quite pleased. Unfortunately, as you see, our stamina did pretty much drain in its entirety. So that's less than ideal. But it's okay. Um, the next thing in the roots to our left coming up are going to be some leaf worms. If we just stay on the outside edge of this uh, little balcony here, walkway, they won't even spawn in. So we can completely avoid them. And we get to move on to the Pilgrim's Gauntlet. Now that I can see that Saurian, I know we have the nicer configuration. The nicer configuration does not have Hellhounds, and it does not have the Dragon and Ghosts. Instead of Hellhounds, we're going to have some Banshees. That's unfortunate. But that didn't work out. <laughs> oh well. Um, but yeah, instead of Hellhounds, we're going to have Banshees instead, and then instead of the fire drake accompanied by wraiths we're going to instead have instead we're going to have uh sirens with some two rather golems the golems as we saw earlier we do plenty of good damage against golems so i'm not overly concerned about them uh the sirens we also have no troubles with, so this is a very generous configuration. Um, if we did not have this configuration, it really increases the duration of this wing of Bitter Black Isle by like, it probably like doubles the time. Because there's not really a whole lot of things that we can't deal actually decent damage to on this run. Here you see me equipped Khaled Bolg, it's because we're going to have spiders. Using Khaled Bolg I can hit only a couple spiders and it'll chain lightning to the rest. It just makes it a little bit more efficient. That's really the only reason we have Khaled Bolg in our inventory whatsoever. It doesn't really give us a whole lot of benefit outside of the chain damage. Um, because anything that's weak to lightning doesn't have so much physical resistance that our overwhelming physical damage in comparison to our magic damage isn't just better. So. Our magic stat just isn't there, even with autonomy and acuity equipped. It's just not quite good enough to really merit using Khaled Bolg over. What is this? Demon's Bane? Devil's Bane, Devil's Bane, I think is what the sword's called. I was going to say Dragon Stock. <laughs> That's wrong. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's not worth it. So here, if you walk up to these, you can get them to move one at a time. If you do it right there, we got a little too close to the second one. But you can get this first one to stand up before the second one does. Um, and by doing that... I missed that guy. I wanted to hit him in the face on my way down. Oh well. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna play monkey in the middle. Oh, I guess not. We're just gonna deal with this one. Typically if I knock both down what I'll do is I'll switch between the two. Like I'm doing right there. 
because I want to make sure that they keep staggering and resetting. But I also want to give them opportunities to stand up. Because in having the opportunities to stand up, they will permit me to... Uh, like, hit their hands or other things. Obviously, if we stun them, that's not going to happen. That was a good example of us not getting health despite killing the golem. The predation augment, as I said before, does not work with the golems. Uh, the medallions don't heal you, as well as getting the overall kill does not heal you. Any. Um, it doesn't really matter, though. There are four spiders behind us. A little alpha over there, so we'll probably switch to the Khaled Bull here and kill them. Yep. And just one sword swing, and we'll have the health that we need to be maxed health again, which was not that much. <laughs> we were not missing much health, but still, we like having full health when we can. And that's it for the Pilgrim's Gauntlet. Yes, there are bats over in the corner, but I don't, I don't really care about dealing with critters. The only other enemies I don't care about doing is spawning the all of the skeletons that exist in the Midnight Helix or the, the Tower of Treasons Repaid. Um, they just genuinely do not exist until you walk over to them, and they're just tedious, so I usually don't kill them on a run. Those are really the only actual enemies that I don't end up killing on a run. Um, and the reason for it is it's, it's entirely a detour. There's no route that takes you that way at all. It's not even like an alternate route. It's <laughs> it's literally a dead end. <laughs> so it's not it's not something I ever do. The only time I go over there is if I'm trying to get the recollections on another person. So here I'm just gonna launch both of these guys off the cliff. Unfortunately now we have the unfortunate circumstance of having to deal with a Glitch. Um, in my experience, if you sheathe your weapons and kind of like walk away from them, they'll often like get low to the ground for you. Here we use hindsight sweep for the iframes. But I'll shield my sheath my weapons again. And that sometimes it can get lower. Um, another option you can do is you can start going down the stairs down the tower and sometimes that'll like bring them into the area underneath that tower right there and that will be low enough to hit them sometimes but it is not consistent because what can happen is one will just drift off the side instead when that happens you have to have a weapon with enough range yeah, see, here we go. He gives us our opportunity to hit him. What's nice is right before he came low to us, he did drop a pustule, so I'm not worried or concerned about getting hit by a curse or other debilitation, which is nice because these things are very annoying, especially when you don't get to deal damage to these guys very often. To get cursed for doing it feels really bad because now you're doing less damage, taking more. Very frustrating enemies to fight without range damage. Um, I am currently streaming a warrior run, uh, and these guys are similarly frustrating. Although I find warrior to be a little bit better because warrior has more damage per hit, so it takes fewer hits for us to hit them. They also swing a little bit higher, so when you do a jumping light attack, you can actually hit them when they're levitating a little bit higher than you can with a fighter. So fighter has to be very uh, selective. And there's us getting hit by the pustule. We weren't cursed, but we were almost cursed. Our magic defense and regular defense are both down. Fortunately, our strength is still up. Uh, we don't have a strength debuff. So strength down the rotation. That would make this a little bit more frustrating because that would mean we would be dealing less damage. I want to say it's like 20% less damage. I might be wrong on that though. Um, 
but we'd be dealing less damage than we currently do, which is already not overly impressive to this guy. They are weak to bludgeoning, not slash, so using our sword isn't really... It's not really, like, the best tactic. Unfortunately, regardless of which configuration of the Fortress of Remembrance we have, we are going to have to deal with two liches. It's whether they are both up here or one's up here and one is down below. Uh, with this configuration, one is up here and one is down below. Um, I don't know which one I would say I prefer better. When they're both up here, we usually get like opportunities to hit one but not the other consistently, so it at least feels like progress more frequently, even though it's slower. Um, but when there's one up here and one below, there's just a lot of waiting for us to have an opportunity to hit this one, obviously, and then the same thing down below. But, it, again, I don't actually know that either one is worse than the other. I will say the other configuration has ghosts, though, which is not what we really want anyway. This uh, configuration is definitely a little more favorable the rest of the way through. So... We'll stick with this one. And if we're lucky, he'll get low again and we can move along. We should be able to kill him next time we get an opportunity to hit. Just because it only looks like maybe three more attacks and he'll be done and dusted. But we do have to get to that point. There's no real telling how long that might take. It has been so long since we hit this guy that the health bar has disappeared on the screen. Uh, this is something I find consistently frustrating when fighting these as a melee vocation. There's just really no speeding up the process. You just have to wait for them. Fortunately, as I said before, eventually he'll get low enough. We'll be able to hit him three times and we get it. We could just walk past that pustule. Obviously, there's no reason for me to kill that. But Fighter is one of the few, well... I guess most vocations are melee or range, so like they can all deal with it better. But between fighter and warrior, fighter has a much kinder time <laughs> popping those, so I always like to pop them when I can. Um, whereas warrior, it's very tricky to get enough to get close enough to hit the pustule without taking damage from it. Uh, so I often don't try to. I'm a little bit surprised that this is the route I chose. Um, as far, I don't mean like route is in path thing, I mean like tactic I chose. Uh, I would have expected myself to grab this guy, kick him off so that he's knocked down, and then immediately grab the other one so that he doesn't spew poison everywhere. Um, but for whatever reason, that's not the tactic I chose to utilize. Um, I guess I wanted to make sure I got all of the... Uh, that's unfortunate. I guess I wanted to make sure I got all of the value out of the healing I can get with the Fate Skewer. But, I don't know. Obviously here, I'm just trying to launch him off the cliff. Free kill. Now, jumping down into this hole, um, a giant, two giant undeads rather, some leaf worms are on that skeleton. 
right there. And then uh, there's also a Banshee. Um, I don't know what the deal with this room is, but it often doesn't spawn immediately. It often despawns enemies after they spawn. A lot of times they'll spawn after I walk by, so I'll walk by, walk back up, and they'll spawn. It's a very odd room. I don't really understand why it does it this way, but it does. This time we were kind of fortunate, and they spawned as we were still in the room. A lot of times I'd go start going down the stairs to about this point, and then I walk back, and they'll spawn in. Sometimes they never do. It's weird. As we said before, we uh, this configuration has Elder Ogre as its carrion beast, and that room could have had it. I, it didn't look like I was being cautious about it, but as a fighter, there isn't a whole lot I get to do about it anyway, so... I don't know. I'm very surprised that this guy's casting at me. Generally, they will always do a... Uh, this move, Stinger from Devil May Cry. They'll do a Blitz Strike or Burst Strike. And uh, the fact that that other one stopped and started casting at me is very odd. I don't really know if uh, I managed to prevent it by being in a certain spot or what. But here, we'll just launch these guys. Unfortunately, I missed the angle on that one. But... What's cool about these grabs is that they uh, are very specific with the direction you're facing. Um, it's kind of double-edged sword in that regard, though, because you can easily miss if you're not close enough to them and you, you don't get caught. You don't catch them in like the the cone of you know effectiveness that the ability has when you when you first press it. But you can line it up really nicely with where you want to send the attack. Which is which I like because it's it's very easy to not have what you're looking for. Unfortunately, once again, we have, as I said before, up above, we have one down below, another lich. All we can do is kind of wait. What's nice about this area is there are a couple more things we can climb on to reach him that he'll get close to sometimes. For example, these little railings. Um, sometimes he'll get close to the rocks. Things like that, but he has to be quite close to it. Uh, as a warrior, I wouldn't have mind jumping on the railing and then getting a single jump attack off there just to deal a little bit of damage. But as a fighter, we don't really have as much reach, so getting that successfully is it's a task. <laughs> Thankfully, there we managed to avoid getting hit by that pustule. Kind of close. Um, we got a good number of hits in there, so if we're lucky he'll get low again. We might only need him to get low three more times if we're fortunate. More than likely it'll be about four times. It ultimately depends on how long he stays down and when he goes low where I'm standing in relation. When a pustule comes out, if a pustule comes out before I'm hitting him, all kinds of things. Fighting these guys is uh, difficult uh, to enjoy on a fighter or a warrior run. Um, it often lulls me to sleep a little bit watching these guys because I'm, I'm just standing there. My brain starts shutting down. I <laughs> gets like you're being hypnotized. not playing the game any longer. But, yeah, whatever.
And once again, it's been so long since we hit it last that we are no longer uh, seeing the health bar. Uh, fortunately, we did a pretty good amount of damage last time we hit it, so maybe two more descents and we'll be good to go. Which we would like to go. Um, because we had good room configurations for the rest of this, and we honestly do great damage against things as a fighter when we're allowed to hit them. Um, except for things like big dragons, things like that. Uh, like Fire Drake, Thunder River, and Frost Room's okay. But uh, outside of those things, we're generally very effective at killing things. Um, but ghosts, banshees... Not banshees, ghosts, liches, very not fun to fight. So, these two liches are probably going to be probably like a third of the entire uh, wing here between Gazer and Dark Bishop. That's okay. Ooh. Oh, criminal. Absolutely criminal. That tiny amount of health left. Yeah, this pretty much never works. It'll always fly a little bit out of your reach. You can generally only climb up and jump off something if you go very quickly. But fortunately, it lowered itself again, so we're happy. Whew. Glad that's over with. That is never fun. It's not even fun to watch again. <laughs> Just knowing how it feels to wait. Tower of Treason is repaid. So this is not the configuration I would prefer. I would prefer the other configuration. Not because this one's like specifically bad. What makes this configuration frustrating is I can't actually kill that first caster. Um, not by my own hand. Uh, occasionally he'll jump out of his cage and kill himself on accident. Um... But it's not, like, something I can effectively cause very often. Another aspect that I don't like about this room is that the Carrion Beast is the Cursed Dragon. And while that doesn't sound too problematic, uh, the Cursed Dragon can spawn pretty early in this room. And since I can't deal with these casters until I get down to the ground level with them... Uh, having the casters up with the Cursed Dragon is very frustrating. It's already frustrating dealing with the casters and these Banshees at the same time, just because so many of their attacks can hit me. But we seem to have made the most of it. There, I just use Fate Skewer to avoid the yell. If she gets her yell off, I get uh, staggered and I'll fall down and whatnot. I don't want that. There I would have preferred to have hit the uh, Banshees uh, before jumping down here. Because the Banshees actually scare me a little bit more because their yell will stagger me and leave me vulnerable to other problems other damage sources, but that's okay. Everything from here out is a skeleton, except for the Cursed Dragon itself. Um, frankly, everything in this room is a skeleton, even the Banshees are weak to bludgeoning. But here you saw us use the tech of Devil, Bloody Finger, remove the weapon, get the real quick Symbol Onslaught attack off to go through our skeletons. The uh, Cursed Dragon spawn. Um, frankly, I'm not overly concerned about it. There's only two more skeletons. One's a caster, one's a big big boy. Um, the Cursed Dragon tries he might to prevent us from doing something. Isn't really going to be effective at preventing us from one-shotting those guys fast enough. Hit the wrong button there. I have to equip both. There we go. And now we just get to duel this guy. I believe this is our first Cursed Dragon for the run. Cursed Dragons aren't bad. Um, they're kind of fun. Well, I find them kind of fun. I like getting perfect blocks off on their arm swing. Here, you can iframe that move with Hindsight Sweep. 
uh, which is very nice. If you're good at aiming, you can also land very nice attacks there. But what's kind of cool about this is if you can bait that arm grab, you can put yourself in a nice position to get pokes in with that. And that does pretty good damage as before. Uh, Shove the fuselage is a great DPS move. Um, I would prefer to knock him down first, but we will struggle to do that. Um, it's just not... The thing about Sheltered Fuselage is it's not really build up a whole lot of stagger. <laughs> it would be better for me to use Antler Toss. Uh, that down slash move, I don't remember what the... That's a core skill combo. I don't remember what it's called. Um, it's not Onslaught or whatever. I don't remember what it's called. That's also got a pretty high amount of stagger buildup on it, so that'll help us get knockdowns, but realistically, we're not going to focus on knocking this guy down too much. We do like the stagger, and if we get the, yeah, I would say if we get the stagger, we can generally go for antler toss for the knockdown, but again, Sheldon Fuselod just happens to do enough damage to these guys, and what's nice about it specifically is... Things like Fire Drakes, Crossworms, their heart, while accessible in the same manner that this one is, they deal aura damage um, of their element if you're just close to their head or their hearts uh, of fire or ice, respectively, depending on the dragon type. Uh, Cursed Dragon doesn't deal damage for you just being in close proximity. It can cause your stuff to rot, but I don't have any stuff, so I'm not overly worried about that. <laughs> I'm not worried at all. I don't have anything in my inventory that can rot. Um, so because of that, we don't really care about being close to the heart, and because of that, it actually opens up the window for us to use Sheltered Fuselade a lot more frequently than we otherwise would on those other dragons, because normally on those other dragons, it's not really safe for us to stay that close to the dragon because we'll either catch fire and take a lot of damage for it, or we'll freeze and likely get hit by another spell as a result. Um, because this guy allows us to just hit him in the heart, we'll just take that opportunity. Well, wow, it's standing. Unfortunately, we got hit there at the very end by the breath. Um, it's kind of frustrating, but we got 100 health back for it. We're only down by about 140 health. 139, I think, is off of max. Forsaken Cathedral. We have the Vile Eye configuration. This is generally the configuration I would prefer. Um, this configuration does not have uh, Eliminator in it, and it also does not have, more importantly, Wraiths. Uh, the other configuration would have Pyrosarium instead of Vile Eyes, and it would also have Wraiths down at the bottom. Um, along with giant Geosarian. It's really just the wraiths that are a problem. Uh, the Pyrosarian are annoying, but they're not overly concerning either. They're supposed to be Garl Goblins. Yeah, there they are. I was going to say, there's supposed to be Goblin Shamans there, but for whatever reason. Here, we don't have our ring equipped, from what I can tell, so we had a really slow soul skewer in consideration of how fast fate skewer is. But as you can see, if he's casting, you can just grab him with the soul skewer, the fate skewer. It, it makes it a very satisfying fight against those guys, because they can be frustrating at times. When they cast and, like, block you immediately and things like that. Here we're going to have corrupted pawns, as well as more goblin shamans. The goblin shamans, obviously, are extremely easy. The pawns are similarly simple, you know, two swings versus one. It's a uh, very easy configuration. Like I said, we're going to get some pretty convenient... There, there are very few things that actually are slow for us to kill uh, in this run. Um, they just kind of become annoying as far as safety goes, and we can only heal with predations. We want to avoid damage, right? Um, the biggest troubles we have on this run is honestly, like, ghosts and wraiths. So, I bet a quarter of our run, maybe even a third of our run through this wing is probably just those two wraiths. 
unfortunately, Dark Bishop's a little bit more scripted. Um, it starts a little bit slow, but it's not bad. Basically, we need to kill the dragon. Once the dragon is dead, we're going to silence the bishop. Because if we don't silence the bishop, it gets annoying. This is not an angle. He cannot cast angle once the dragon's dead. This is execute. See? This would be some sort of debilitation spell, whether it be torpor or more than likely petrification. Later, it could also cast uh, Maelstrom, but it has to be lower in health. We want to actually bring his health down at least somewhat. This is going to be a Maelstrom. You can tell because it's dark and he's got his arms crossed out. And as I said, it's a pretty scripted fight. We just do enough damage. When he lowers, we can just wail on him with the, the tech of no weapon plus the double bloody knuckles. It's a very, very nice fight considering when you're low level, fighting him solo is actually <laughs> a bit frustrating. But still very serviceable because all you have to do is deal enough damage for him to go into the drake and then you could hit the drake kind of nicely. Especially if you have a silencing sword, then you can, you know, wail on the bishop again while it's unconscious on the ground. And then you just kind of have to wait again. But not this time. Quite strong. And that'll wrap up the second wing. We've got one more to go. But that'll be next time. Uh, I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to drop a like and a follow if you did uh be also sure to check out my stream my stream monday through friday 10 30 eastern time over at twitch.tv slash local i hope to see you there cheers everyone